The exam format will be similar to what we've had before for exam one, except it's going to be online, and everybody has to use uh, the Respondus uh, lockdown browser with Monitor. Um, you should have instructions for how to set that up. If, uh, if you try that and it doesn't work, uh, let me know as soon as you can because uh, there's a practice quiz that you should all should have tried anyway. Um, the format, as I said, is going to be similar to what was on the previous exam. So it will have options in terms of which questions you choose. Uh, there will be some limitations on which ones you choose. So uh, there will be requirements for, for questions from certain sections that you have to pick. Um, one of those options is a multiple choice. So if you thought multiple choice was a great thing in the last exam, there'll be a multiple choice section that you could do. But um, most of the exam is written, so you'll be writing out answers. Unfortunately, there's no way for us to have you draw on this exam. So you'll really have to use your words. Uh, my current plan is that you'll have, instead of two and a half hours, you have three hours to take the exam. And also, in terms of flexibility, I'll make it available from 6 in the morning until midnight on Thursday. So whenever you feel best able to take the exam, you'll be able to fit in that block of time. And, uh, and that's, that's how we do it. Um, I apologize. Uh, when I discovered that there was no way for you to draw or do anything like that, I was upset. But uh, I think we're all upset about what the conditions are that we have to do this under. And uh, we'll try to make do with what we have. Okay. Uh, the other question that came up was about that particular, um, in that particular syndrome, um, what I want you to be concerned about is what kind of mutation is, is, uh, is affected. So kind of mutation. And it says it's a missense mutation, right? So it's a point mutation in this example. Point mutation. And the type of mutation uh, that it is is a missense mutation. So it's a particular amino acid that gets changed because of that single nucleotide change. Okay. Um, the next uh, set of slides has to do with uh, the monoamine oxidase A. Uh, this is typically um, called the the warrior gene. And in this example, the thing that you need to be uh, familiar with is that the level, so first of all, the level of expression affects either anxiety levels or the likelihood of uh, antisocial behavior. I believe that the, the main point is that high levels leads to increased anxiety and depression. And depression. Do you have remedies? Whereas decreased levels can lead to antisocial behavior. including um, what has been called sociopathic behavior or violent behavior. Now, in terms of the levels, the control of these levels has to do with um, repeats in the promoter area. And all I want you to understand from this is that if you increase the levels of uh, e expression by um, the, the kind of promoter, there's more likelihood of anxiety or depression. If you decrease the level of expression by repeats in the promoter area, that can lead to antisocial behavior. And then there's one additional thing which has to do with um, epigenetics. 
And the one example that's talked about is um, methylation. In women especially, And then the other, uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that with these kinds of uh, effects in terms of uh, antisocial or um, violent behavior, the environment plays a role. Okay, so uh, was a child abused that had this particular form of the gene? That, uh, that has reduced MAOA activity? Um, is there smoking that happened in utero? Um, things like that. Uh, and that, those are the main things I want you to take home from, uh, from that particular example. And I believe after that, we started to talk about um, things related to dogs. Oh, okay, so the next one is meyer gorlin syndrome. Uh, so for meyer gorlin syndrome, uh, the main take home lesson for that is that uh, the control of the replication complex in humans is uh, what's what's defective in this particular uh, syndrome. So for meyer gorlin syndrome, <coughs> sorry. Could you repeat the it's control of replication complex? Yes. So the the control of replication. So I believe what they talk about there is the uh, origin recognition complex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the origin recognition complex is defective and that is what causes the, uh, the syndrome, this uh, extreme dwarfism. Okay, so then the next set of slides have to do with dogs. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I don't know how many of you are uh, dog lovers. Yeah, at least, at least a couple of you. Yeah, good, all right. Getting there. Good. Getting there, okay. <laughs> Coming after me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so basically, you know, those those who are familiar with dogs, who love dogs, or even if you don't like dogs, know that there's a great variety in terms of kinds of breeds of dogs. But uh, dogs and uh, wolves, and I'm not sure what other um, canines, are actually all the same species. So all these differences that we see are due to um, different forms of different genes. And so the next set of slides deals with. Um, the kinds of variation that you see in terms of size of dogs, so you have dogs that are uh, as small as a Chihuahua or as big as a Great Dane, and um, so that has to do with a mutation in uh, the, uh, the a growth insulin-like growth factor gene. Um, in particular, that one has a missense mutation, and so the the. The main take home that I want you to get from the rest of these discussions uh, for uh, various phenotypes in dogs is what kind of a mutation it is or what difference it is that um, not necessarily this particular amino acid change, but if there's an amino acid change, so in this particular example, uh, there is a, um, it looks like an arginine to a histidine change, you don't need to know that. You just need to know that it's a, a missense mutation, okay? And that's gonna be sort of the, the trend for a lot of these different discussions. Um, so there's the, the discussion of genes related to the size of the dogs. Um, the next, uh, the next um, slide in that series talks about um, leg the, length. sorry, leg, leg length. length. So talking about like basset hounds and um, also dachshunds that have really short legs. Uh, that actually has to do with a, a large insertion of a gene that gets activated because of where it gets inserted. Um, so knowing that that's not a point mutation, right? That's a large insertion. And because that gene that's inserted gets activated, uh, it's thought that that is responsible for sort of closing off the size of those uh, legs in those dogs that, or those breeds of dog that are short-legged. Okay. Um, 
And then the next, the next uh, example has to do with uh, the different kinds of jaws or, or head shapes that you have in dogs. Um, and so in, um, without worrying about the different kinds of head shapes, because there's, there's uh, examples of the, the really um, smashed in face dogs, like uh, boxers and I guess pugs and dogs like that, versus sort of medium snout versus long snout uh, dogs. Um, don't worry about the terminology for those. Um, but there's a gene uh, that they've associated with uh, jaw development, craniofacial development. Uh, that would be, yes, that one. So that would be the BMP3 gene. And again, even in that one, the main thing to realize is that that is an amino acid change. So that would be what kind of a change if it involves an amino acid change? Missing. Missing, exactly. So just, just being aware of what kinds of changes there are. Okay. Uh, the next set of slides in that series have to do with something that we haven't talked about in class at all before, which is this concept of polyploidy. And I'll, um, I'll talk about that in uh, greater depth on here. So is it okay if I erase what we have here? Okay. And for those of you who are not here, uh, I apologize for the order that this is being presented in, because um, this is really sort of the end, talking about certain specific kinds of mutations, uh, adding on to what we've already talked about. But um, we, I think there's some people who want to be sure that we covered that aspect, since we're not going to have a chance in person to, uh, to go over those slides. All right, so the last half of that, uh, of this series, if you want to um, just go ahead a little bit more. There we go. Keep going. Okay. So the last half has to do with something called polyploidy. And this has to do with increasing the number of sets of chromosomes. There are organisms that are haploid that have one set. Typically, these are um, prokaryotes. Um, there are some cells of eukaryotes that can be haploid. So it will be an example of haploid cells in uh, eukaryotes. Okay. Yeah, gametes. Right. So, so let's say prokaryotes. gametes and eukaryotes. And then there are diploid cells, like ours. So two sets. Typically you see this represented as 2N. But if you have three sets, that's called triploid. Etc. Now, these are the ones where we're talking about polyploidy. And polyploidy is something that's not typically found in, um, in mammals or in animals. There's one example in the slides of this um, uh, Argentinian rodent that is tetraploid. Um, and what, what uh, what you should get out of this whole discussion is when you do have polyploidy, you're going to have an increase in the amount of DNA. And so in that example of that degu, that uh, Argentinian rodent, there's an increased amount of DNA in the sperm of those uh, individuals. Uh, and the other thing that 
uh, you can take home from polyploidy is polyploid organisms tend to be larger. Okay. Now, it is something that you do see in plants typically. So polyploidy is common in plants. So a lot of the plants that we use as food are polyploid plants. And so um, one of the things that, that these slides go through is sort of trying to understand, for example, how modern bread wheat came into, into being. And um, the, the title of that slide, Cataclysmic Evolution, is it's labeled that for a good reason, which is that um, the way we understand bread wheat to have come into existence is a way in which we could actually visualize evolution. Um, and when we talk about uh, visualizing evolution, we're talking about visualizing the emergence of different species. That's something that, um, you know, people that, that question whether or not evolution is, is a, a, an actual um, fact of existence say, well, you, show me how you can see different species emerge. And with catalytic, cat, cataclysmic evolution, you can actually see that because um, in this series of slides, it talks about different species of plant uh, producing a sterile hybrid. So you guys are probably familiar with the concept of sterile hybrid. Maybe not. All right, how about this? If you take a horse and a donkey and you mate them, what do you get? Yeah. You get a mule. Can the mule reproduce? No. No, it's sterile. I'm sorry? There are exceptions. In, in, in the case of mules? Mm -hmm. Oh, <gasps> let me ask you this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. There aren't exceptions in a henny though, which is the same thing except backwards. Uh, okay, so here's, here's the question. I, not knowing the, the biological sex of these, I'm going to predict that if the individual is female, that that individual has the possibility of being fertile. I think so, yeah. Okay, yeah. That's, that's also a theme that you'll see. So as you go further on in this, con this discussion of uh, polyploidy, uh, we talk about uh, tigons and ligers. So when a, when a, ti when a, a female what is it? When a male tiger mates with a female lion, I think that's a tigon. And when a male lion mates with a female tiger, that's a liger. That's the difference in a mule and a henny. So a mule comes from a uh, female horse and a male donkey, while a henny comes from a male horse and a female donkey. Okay. And then, and then if that individual that's produced is female, mm -hmm then that, I think, is fertile, or can be yes. fertile. for mules, so far, is what they know. Yeah, well, it also turns out to be true for tigons and ligers. So if you have a female tigon or a female liger, they can mate with other big cats and produce whatever it is that they, you know, they, they get. You can get Thai tigers and Lai ligons and that kind of stuff. And Trying to understand exactly why that works is complicated, and um, it's something for you all to, to ponder. Um, but what I, what I really want you to get out of this is um, why it should even be a problem at all. So why is it a problem if two different species mate? Yeah? Because they probably have a different number of chromosomes, so there isn't a way to do like proper crossing over. Well, there isn't any way to do proper crossing over, but if their chromosomes are different enough, and that means that they don't have a full set of any of the chromosomes, right? So if we do this, so let's say you've got, uh, so you have one species here that's got all these A chromosomes. So A1, A2, A3. And let's say that this is the gamete of one species. So this is the gamete of species A. Dr. Perlin, yes, your video, I don't know if it shut off or anything, but your screen went a darker color. I don't no. know if that has affected it. I don't know if it, it sure. probably, yeah, okay, that's not good. I don't know why it did that. 
Okay, well, that means you're probably missing something. So I'm hoping that you guys' recordings are better than the one I'm doing. All right, so we come back now. Um, I'm not sure why we had an interruption, but uh, yeah, now we're recording again. And we're talking about uh, why when two different species mate, uh, they produce a sterile uh, hybrid. So if this species here, species B, And this is a gamete of species B. When they come together, they're going to produce an individual that has um, that has one set of the B uh, chromosomes and one set of the A chromosomes. But this particular individual has no way of producing gamete cells that have all of the chromosomes because they're not diploid, right? They just have a complete set of the chromosomes from uh, each of the two original parents. So this is a sterile hybrid. Does everybody in the audience understand why it's sterile? Yes. So if this is the... If Sorry, that's fine. Oh, it's yours. Okay, good. Um, so if this is what you get from the fertilization between these two gametes, mm -hmm. this individual has uh, one of each of the chromosomes from the original parents, correct? Mm -hmm. But when they try to produce gametes, normally during meiosis, you should have, so for this individual to get these gametes of the A, you had all of the A's line up and then going through the divisions you wind up with cells that look like that right that have only one of each of the different kinds of chromosomes and the same thing would be true for this other parent as well but there's no way to do that here because there aren't two copies of each of the chromosomes. There's only one copy of each chromosome that came from each of the two parents. So that individual should be sterile. And normally there's no way to get around that because, um, because that's what you got. But sometimes mistakes can happen. For example, if this cell were to replicate and not divide, it would become diploid for all of these different um, individuals, right? But in reality, then, this, if that were to happen, if this were to double, so if the chromosome number were to double without division, then you would have an individual, or at least you have a cell that was uh, tetraploid, right? It would now have had both this set doubled and this set doubled, and that would be tetraploid relative to the two parents. And that, this individual, this new individual, so let's see what that is. This individual would now have two copies of each of these. And so that cell would be capable of undergoing meiosis. Okay. And that, uh, those gametes that are produced, if they had a compatible gamete to then mate with or to come together with, then they could produce a new individual. And that new individual would be a different species from either of these two and it would no longer be a sterile hybrid. Does that make sense? You in the audience, you don't get to you don't get to tell me one way or the other. But um, but you in the in the audience that's here, it, it, does that make sense? Why why not quite? Okay. So first of all, do you understand why this would have to happen for meiosis to take place? So. 
For meiosis to take place, you have to have doubling of the total number of chromosomes in order for them to pair up during meiosis. Then this cell would produce, let's say, um, so this cell could produce, uh, say, a sperm cell. If this, if this individual were, were male, okay. Now, the reason this is so hard in mammals and am other animals is that you can't fertilize yourself, right? But in plants, you can. So there are plants that are capable of self fertilization because they have both the male and female parts. And so if this kind of thing were to happen in a plant so that they produced sperm cells that had the correct number of chromosomes. And also, uh, in another part of the plant, the same kind of mistake happened, so they produced the female types of cells. Then during cell fertilization, you'd get this put together again as a, as a new uh, individual. And that new individual would be fertile. And not only would it be fertile, it would be a different species because it would no longer be able to mate with either of its two parents and it would not be the sterile hybrid that it started out with. Does that make sense? So that's kind of the gist of what I want you to get from that. And I think that's really the rest of the slides. It's really just uh, thinking about how that would have to happen in plants um, and how it, how it did happen. Because in the case of bread wheat, not only can you hypothesize who the original parental species were, but you can actually take those species, mate them, get the sterile hybrid, force that sterile hybrid to do this, and then create the new species and have it mate with the other predicted parents, and eventually you get bread wheat. So you can, you can make this hypothetical process of evolution occur in the laboratory. Um, so not only predict and have a hypothesis about what happened, but you can also make it happen in the laboratory. Okay. Um, and then the other examples in that set of slides really have to do with, so what happens in animals? And just, it, again, it shows you that, for the most part, we think that when two different species mate, you produce a sterile hybrid, occasionally you can get something that's fertile. And the bottom takeaway lesson from those are all the examples we know about, when the sterile hybrid is not sterile, it's the female individual of that, of that hybrid that is possibly capable of reproducing. Okay? So that's pretty much all, all the stuff in the slides. Question? Um, in the slides you showed two um, examples of wheat evolution, mm -hmm. and one had, like, it, you had... Different, to, different, uh, I think one of them had different potential um, parental species. Is that, is that... Or it was like AABB, and then it created an organism that was AABB. Right. And then one had AA and then BB, and it created an organism that was just AB. Well, when it creates the one that's just AB, that's the sterile hybrid. Yeah. To, to make it, to, to go from that to becoming another species, you have to have this duplication, so it becomes AABB. So how is the first situation where it didn't even create the sterile hybrid possible in the slides? Uh, I think they were just kind of shortcutting the steps. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think what you have to, uh, I think the later slides, I'd have to look at the slide, but I think the later slides show you step by step. So yeah, so this in, this, in this slide that has, which slide is that? That's number 18. 18. It shows you um, the initial mating, you get a sterile hybrid, you get a duplication of the total number of chromosomes, and that gives you the AABB, and then that mates with a different species that again gives you a sterile hybrid, ABD, and then you get the duplication that makes it possible to produce uh, gametes that are viable, and are not viable, but th that have the, the correct number of chromosomes. And then um, when that duplication happens, you get bread wheat, which is hexaploid. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's the main thing to take away from that, is that in order for this to ever work, you have to have this uh, mistake, basically. You have to have the duplication that occurs of all the chromosomes in this cell in order to be able to produce a cell that can produce gametes that has the complete uh, component of chromosomes for it to work. Okay? Is that 
more or less um, answer the questions about the slides. Yes. So would you want us to know like in more detail than what you covered today, or is this just like? I think what we covered today is mainly what I want you to know for, for, for an exam, for example. Okay. Of course, if you're interested in this stuff, you can know yeah. as much as you want. But as, in terms of an exam, I think the detail that we just talked about is uh, sufficient. Thank you. Okay. All right, any other questions about the slides? Yes. So it's kind of related to the uh, self-fertilization thing that plants can do. So yeah. it's not like, is that similar to cloning? Uh, no. Cloning would be if you were to produce an identical um, plant, either from, uh, there are a number of ways to do it. One way would be to take a piece of the plant and let it grow, and then vegetatively it will produce something that's the same as what you cut off. Another way would be uh, to take a single cell and develop a, like a tissue culture of that plant that way and grow that up into a plant. That would be cl cloning. The reason it's not cloning is because you are creating a different outcome than the, than the parent, right? So the parent, um, it may not be um, very different from the parent in this case, but you're, you are creating an offspring rather than a clone. Okay. Yeah, I think that's the main, main difference. Okay? I think I get it. Okay, cool. All right, uh, any other questions about any of this? Okay, so now we're gonna switch gears. Now we're gonna switch gears and kind of start from the beginning, from right after uh, when we started the, uh, this, this section of the material. Okay. So rather than work, work our way backwards, we're going to start with uh, the first major set of stuff that we're interested in. And that is uh, strategies for regulating gene expression. So, so the first major section that we talked about and I would say that's the majority of what we talked about, are strategies that deal with the um, DNA to RNA transition. So making a decision about whether or not a particular region of DNA is transcribed into RNA, okay? And the first part after the break that we, that we used to talk about that had to do with um, specifically what we would call uh, strategies where regulatory proteins or other, um, other actors in this process would either allow or disallow transcription of the DNA into RNA, okay? So that section included, uh, and for prokaryotes, the discussion of operons. So operons we define as? A series of structural genes co-regulated. Okay, so a series of genes co-regulated. And how are they co-regulated? That's right, For uh, by making a decision about whether the RNA that they're all transcribed onto gets transcribed or not. defines an operon, and that definition only applies to prokaryotes. So although there are strategies for regulating multiple genes in eukaryotes, they don't do it this way. Okay. 
And a second part of that is this uh, concept of negative control versus positive control. So how do they differ? What's the negative control? Transcription is always on. Okay, so transcription is always on. Unless, okay, so unless a regulatory protein binds to, what does it bind to? Operator. Operator to block RNA polymerase at the promoter. Okay. And so we we're giving you these definitions because once you understand these definitions, then we can apply those to particular examples. Okay. Uh, and so for positive control, transcription is always oh. off. Mm -hmm. Unless a positive regulatory protein. Again, binds to the operator to help RNA polymerase at the promoter. Okay, and so the, the main thing to take home from this is the emphasis is on the role of the regulatory protein. How does the regulatory protein affect the outcome in terms of transcription? Okay, transcription would be on if the regulatory protein weren't around, and you're talking about negative control. So the regulatory protein is negatively having an effect on the levels of transcription. If, um, if the regulatory protein went around, the transcription would essentially be off, then the role of the regulatory protein is to help or stimulate transcription, okay? All right, uh, and then we basically went through, so what the components are of an option. So you've got structural genes, and these encode proteins and enzymes for a particular pathway. And those pathways could be uh, synthetic, synthetic example would be if you're talking about biosynthesis of some um, end product. Like, for example, tryptophan. And degradative would be um, uh, catabolism. Breakdown and an example of that would be lactose. Okay, we talked about both of those kinds of operons uh, in the class. And then you've also got a um, promoter where RNA polymerase binds. And you've got uh, an operator not to be confused with the operon itself. The operator is a DNA sequence, right? And then somewhere else you've got a uh, gene for a regulatory protein which has its own promoter. So when the regulatory protein gene is uh, transcribed, 
you get the regulatory protein And what's the goal of the regulatory protein? To bind the upper To bind the upper Your camera turned off again. Okay, yeah, that's frustrating. Maybe if we just click up the OK button, not to turn it back on. The screen itself. Let's find out. Can it say any your points? Let's see. Go oh, back to recording. Oh, wow. Thanks. Okay, not sure. Um, anyway, you guys probably have better recordings, and uh, your uh, classmates will uh, appreciate them. Who is recording? Me. Just the voice. Yeah, just the voice. Too. So, several people. Oh, so you have it just on voice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think they're doing. You're doing it with this. Right? Okay, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> appreciate it. All right. So, regulatory protein uh, binds the operator, and then um, the outcome depends on whether you're talking about something that is negatively controlled or positively controlled. Okay. Now, the one thing missing from this uh, this particular diagram is what? Inducer. Yeah, the inducer. Okay, so the inducer, and uh, I don't want to bias this based on the colors, but the inducer is the connection to the outside world. This is some chemical signal uh, from the environment. And what does the inducer do? Okay, binds the regulatory protein and it alters the conformation of the regulatory protein. So these are all general terms because um, the different, you have quite a question, which I'll get to in a second. Um, these are general terms because for different operons, the outcome is different depending upon, uh, for example, if we're talking about the lactose operon or the tryptophan operon, what is this altered conformation making the regulatory protein do or not do? Okay, so that's a kind of a generalization. Your question is: If you ask us on the exam to describe all the components of the operon, would we mention an inducer because it's technically not on the operon? Or um, you should mention the inducer because it's the one thing that brings this into reality. Oh. So the inducer is important. It's not part of the operon in the sense that it's not part of the genes. Or it, that's that was the next question I was going to ask you: Is what gene codes for the inducer? Mm -hmm. None. There is no such gene. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but it's a, it's a signal that is critical for the operon to function properly. And that's something that you need to understand. Yes? Will we include RNA polymerase on the operon? No. Okay. No, the RNA polymerase is not, is not specific for a particular operon. RNA polymerase, it doesn't even have to work with an operon. It can work with a gene, an independent gene, that there's only one gene in that particular uh, messenger RNA that gets made. Yes, question. So just to clarify, so the components of operon will be structural genes, promoter, operator, right. inducer, and then the PR, the regulatory gene, promoter, and then promoter for that. Right, the regulatory protein genes. And then regular, yeah. yeah and the, and it's promoter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so okay. those, those are part of it. Uh, because without any of those components, you don't have a functioning opera. Okay? All right, any other questions about that before we bring in specific examples? So lactose operon being the first particular example that we, that we discussed. Okay? All right, so let's see. All right, so what we'll do is erase it's very safe yet. All right, so what we'll do is include the structural genes for the LAC operon. So the LAC operon has three structural genes, Z, Y, and A. 
And the regulatory protein gene for the LAC operon is um, the I gene. Okay. And again, this is for the lactose operon. Now, this type of operon is for the breakdown of sugars like lactose, beta lactoside sugars. So this operon is synthetic or degraded? <laughs> degraded. Okay. And now we'll see what uh, what the other components are involved with. So when we transcribe this operon, we get the products of these three structural genes. And the Z gene encodes an enzyme called beta lactosidase. So LAC Z is the same as beta galactosidase, the lac -Z protein. And then the Y gene becomes permease. So lac Y is permease. And lac A is transacetylase. Transacetylase, we said, is um, is basically for uh, detoxification. So sometimes when um, the beta galactosidase, which uh, breaks down beta galactosides. Sometimes when it takes a particular sugar and breaks it down, the products that it makes are toxic to the cell. And so um, the transacetylase modifies those breakdown products so that they're no longer toxic. Okay. Uh, permease, as the name suggests, uh, makes the cell permeable to beta-galactosides. And then beta lactosidase breaks them down. There are actually two reactions that it catalyzes or can catalyze, and it depends on the concentration of lactose in the cell. So, when the concentration of lactose in the cell is high, then beta lactosidase converts lactose into what? Lactose. Glucose. Right, glucose plus galactose. But when the concentration of lactose in the cell is low, it, 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 yes, it gets converted to allolactose, which will come up uh, in a minute. Okay? So those are two different kinds of reactions that beta galactosidase can catalyze, and it's concentration dependent in the cell. Okay? Questions about any of that? Um, now, in terms of the other components of this operon, you've got the I gene, which encodes the LAC I regulatory protein. And that does bind to the operator. And what's the effect of LAC I protein binding to the operator? Blocks are an polymerase. So, what type of control is this, positive or negative? Does everybody understand that the lack operon is under negative control because of what we just said? Okay. Any question about that? Okay. All right. Um, and then the one thing that's missing from this story so far, of course, is the inducer. And what do you suppose the inducer in this situation should be? Well, that's because you already know that's allolactose. But but what should it be logically? Lactose. Lactose or any other beta galactoside sugar that can be acted on by beta galactosidase, right? 
So any other sugar that could be utilized by the cell using beta-galactosidase to break it down should be a potential inducer. Um, as we already know, it just so happens that lactose isn't actually an inducer by itself. So lactose is, uh, is something that can be converted into allolactose, which then is an inducer. So in this example, um, what I would say is that this inducer is something that looks like lactose. But we already know it's not actually lactose itself. Okay? All right, any questions about any of this? Okay. All right, so um, the next questions that come up are how does this actually work? Um, we talked about sort of the nature of the operator, the fact that the operator has this sequence that um, um, has dyad symmetry, in other words, that is something that the enzyme, that, that is to say that the, uh, that the regulatory protein will be able to recognize no matter which direction it comes to that area, okay? And we also said that the regulatory protein in order to work effectively needs to have four molecules of LAC I bind to the operator. And if all four molecules don't bind, then that gives RNA polymerase still a chance to do some transcription. Okay? Uh, that's an important take home lesson, which is that you're really not talking about fully shutting off the LAC operon when there's no inducer present. What you're talking about is making it low when there's no inducer and then elevating the level when it's uh, when inducer is available. Okay? So it's low when you get these, uh, these molecules of lac I protein binding to the operator. That's going to reduce the ability um, most effectively when all four are bound. But um, it's not easy to get all four of those bound to completely block RNA polymerase. So you're going to have low level transcription when there's no inducer. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the other thing is this, this I, is an idea related to that, which is that you need permease to get the inducer into the cell, which means that you need some transcription of the operon, even if inducer is absent. And you also need another enzyme um, to, to get this to work, which is what? Beta-galactosidase. So both the Z and Y genes have to be expressed at a low level, or else you wouldn't have permease to bring in the inducer when it's available outside, and you wouldn't have beta-galactosidase to convert lactose into an actual inducer. So that's all evidence that there must be transcription going on at some level, even without inducer. Question? Um, so can allolactose be present outside of the cell and it, permease can bring it in? Or it, it could, but it's unlikely. I mean, allolactose is not something you typically would find in nature. Okay. Um, uh, I mean, you, you could have some of that, but like, you know, I'm not even sure you can buy allolactose in the store. You know, it's going <laughs> It gets made by by the beta lab, made by the side okay. And then uh, you had a question. Oh wait, I got it. Okay. All right. Now um, the next set of experiments we talked about were so what happens if you get mutations? Um, so we can talk about that next if you like. All right. So I'm going to I'm erase a bunch of stuff over here. All right, so what we'll do is now discuss um, different levels of transcription and how that might or might change depending upon whether an inducer is present and also depending upon um, whether there's a, a particular mutation. So um, what we'll do is 
talk about a particular um, phenotype or genotype and then we'll talk about um, what happens when there's no inducer versus when there is inducer and now we're here talking about levels of transcription I think uh, those of you who've taken the lab have already done uh, a complementation experiment, if you've taken the lab. Yeah, so it's very, very similar to what goes on in the lab as far as um, using IPTG and XGAL as a proxy or as, a, as an alternative way of measuring levels of transcription. Okay. But in this particular case, we talked about wild type, LAC plus cells. And in that situation, if there's no inducer present, we're talking about levels of transcription of the lac operon. When there's no inducer present, what should the level of transcription be? Low level or high? Low. Exactly. And that's because? Regulatory protein is bound. That's right. So regulatory protein, as we saw over here, is bound to the operator blocking RNA polymerase. Mm -hmm. So without inducer, that level should be low, and when inducer's present, it should be high. high. Exactly. Okay. So based on that, then when we start getting different mutations, we can think about, so why do those mutations change this, or do they? Yes, question. question. Yes. Um, this might be a stupid question, I guess, no. but it's low because they do, so inducer is basically like the way to start the whole process. It's the way to alter what's happening with the regulatory protein. Okay. So it's basically a way for the for the um, this process of regulation to be connected to the reality that the cell finds itself in. Okay. That makes and, sense. And, and so the inducer is the reality check. It's like, why are you blocking transcription? There's plenty of lactose free to eat. Why are you blocking that? And mm -hmm. so then the regulatory protein says, Oh, you're right, I guess I should I should get off mm -hmm. and, and let this do let the lac opera do what the lac opera wants to do, which is be on all the time. Mm -hmm. I've been I've been tamping that down, but you now told me, ah, here's some of this food that can be eaten. Now the transcription can go on as it would have otherwise. Okay. All right, so let's talk about that. Let's, so let's say we have a mutant. I'm going to call this mutant lac I minus. And this mutant, as you recall, is a mutant that either makes no lac I protein or it makes a regulatory protein that is unable to bind to the operator. For purposes of this discussion, those are essentially the same thing, right? If you don't make any regulatory protein or the one that you make can't bind to the operator, so this doesn't happen, you're going to get the same outcome. And what is that outcome? Mm -hmm. So, so oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, so you have a high expression under both situations. Right? With inducer, you would expect it to be high anyway. But this is how you know that you're working with a mutant. Because the level should not be high, look at wild type, the level should not be high if there's no inducer. Okay? And so this is another example where you need to think about what do we mean by the phenotype of a particular mutant. So the phenotype isn't what it does when inducer's present. It isn't what it does when there's no inducer present. It's the comparison of those two so you get the full picture. Okay. So we know that this is a mutant because in comparison to wild type, whose phenotype is low without inducer and high with inducer, you have high on both situations. That's how you know you're dealing with a mutant. Okay. Okay. Um, now, we talked about another kind of mutant that could give you the same phenotype, uh, which is a mutation in the operator sequence itself, so that the I protein doesn't know how to bind to that, it doesn't recognize it anymore. Not the fault of the regulatory protein, it's the fault of the operator sequence itself. And so that's referred to as the LAC OC. Um, this one, it's, sorry. Constitutive. Constitutive. And constitutive means? That's right, on all the time. And um, if you think about that one, 
the phenotype of that is I on both conditions. Okay, and it's it's the same phenotype because you get the same outcome, which is.